Chapter 1. The Right to Be Rich Whatever may be said in praise of poverty, the fact remains that it is not possible to live a really complete or successful life unless one is rich. No man can rise to his greatest possible height in talent or soul development unless he has plenty of money, for to unfold the soul and to develop talent he must have many things to use, and he cannot have these things unless he has money to buy them with. A man develops in mind, soul, and body by making use of things, and society is so organized that man must have money in order to become the possessor of things. Therefore, the basis of all advancement for a man must be the science of getting rich. The object of all life is development, and everything that lives has an inalienable right to all the development it is capable of attaining. Man's right to life means his right to have the free and unrestricted use of all the things which may be necessary to his fullest mental, spiritual, and physical unfoldment, or, in other words, his right to be rich. In this book, I shall not speak of riches in a figurative way. To be really rich does not mean to be satisfied or contented with a little. No man ought to be satisfied with a little if he is capable of using and enjoying more. The purpose of nature is advancement and unfoldment of life and every man should have all that can contribute to the power, elegance, beauty, and richness of life. To be content with less is sinful. The man who owns all he wants for the living of all the life he is capable of living is rich, and no man who has not plenty of money can have all he wants. Life has advanced so far, and become so complex, that even the most ordinary man or woman requires a great amount of wealth in order to live in a manner that even approaches completeness. Every person naturally wants to become all that they are capable of becoming. This desire to realize innate possibilities is inherent in human nature. We cannot help wanting to be all that we can be. Success in life is becoming what you want to be. You can become what you want to be only by making use of things, and you can have the free use of things only as you become rich enough to buy them. To understand the science of getting rich is therefore the most essential of all knowledge. There is nothing wrong in wanting to get rich. The desire for riches is really the desire for a richer, fuller, and more abundant life, and that desire is praiseworthy. The man who does not desire to live more abundantly is abnormal, and so the man who does not desire to have money enough to buy all he wants is abnormal. There are three motives for which we live. We live for the body, we live for the mind, we live for the soul. No one of these is better or holier than the other. All are alike desirable, and no one of the three, body, mind, or soul, can live fully if either of the others is cut short of full life and expression. It is not right or noble to live only for the soul and deny mind or body, and it is wrong to live for the intellect and deny body or soul. We are all acquainted with the loss and consequences of living for the body and denying both mind and soul and we can see that real life means the complete expression of all that man can give forth through body, mind, and soul. Whatever he can say, no man can be really happy or satisfied unless his body is living fully in every function, and unless the same is true for his mind and his soul. Wherever there is unexpressed possibility, or function not performed, there is unsatisfied desire. Desire is possibility seeking expression, or function seeking performance. Man cannot live fully in body without good food, comfortable clothing, and warm shelter, and without freedom from excessive toil. Rest and recreation are also necessary for his physical life. He cannot live fully in mind without books and time to study them, without opportunity to travel and observation, or without intellectual companionship. To live fully in mind, he must have intellectual recreations, and must surround himself with all the objects of art and beauty he is capable of using and appreciating. To live fully in soul, man must have love, and love is denied expression by poverty. A man's highest happiness is found in the bestowal of benefits on those he loves. Love finds its most natural and spontaneous expression in giving. The man who has nothing to give cannot fill his place as a husband or father, as a citizen, or as a man. It is in the use of material things that the man finds full life for his body, develops his mind, and unfolds his soul. It is therefore for supreme importance to him that he should be rich. It is perfectly right that you should desire to be rich. If you are a normal man or woman, you cannot help doing so. It is perfectly right that you should give your best attention to the science of getting rich, for it is the noblest and most necessary of all studies. 
if you neglect this study you are derelict in your duty to yourself to god and humanity for you can render to god and humanity no greater service than to make the most of yourself end of chapter one any person may become great there is a principle of power in every person by the intelligent use and direction of this principle man can develop his own mental faculties man has an inherent power by which he may grow in whatsoever direction he pleases and there does not appear to be any limit to the possibilities of his growth no man has yet become so great in any faculty but that it is possible for someone else to become greater the possibility is in the original substance from which man is made. Genius is omniscience flowing into man. Genius is more than talent. Talent may merely be one faculty developed out of proportion to other faculties. But genius is the union of man and God in the acts of the soul. Great men are always greater than their deeds. They are in connection with a reserve of the power that is without limit. We do not know where the boundary of the mental powers of man is. We do not even know that there is a boundary. The power of conscious growth is not given to the lower animals. It is man's alone and may be developed and increased by him. The lower animals can, to a great extent, be trained and developed by man. But man can train and develop himself. He alone has this power, and he has it to an apparently unlimited extent. The purpose of life for man is growth just as the purpose of life for trees and plants is growth. Trees and plants grow automatically and along fixed lines. Man can grow as he will. Trees and plants can only develop certain possibilities and characteristics. Man can develop any power, which is or has been shown by any person, anywhere. Nothing that is possible in spirit is impossible in flesh and blood. Nothing that man can think is impossible in action. Nothing that man can imagine is impossible of realization. Man is formed for growth, and he is under the necessity of growing. It is essential to his happiness that he should continuously advance. Life without progress becomes unendurable, and the person who ceases from growth must either become imbecile or insane. The greater and more harmonious and well-rounded his growth, the happier man will be. There is no possibility in any man that is not in every man. But if they proceed naturally, not two men will grow into the same thing, or be alike. Every man comes into the world with a predisposition to grow along certain lines, and growth is easier for him along those lines than in any other way. This is a wise provision, for it gives endless variety. It is as if a gardener should throw all his bulbs into one basket. To the superficial observer, they would look alike, but growth reveals the tremendous difference. So of men and women, they are like a basket of bulbs. One may be a rose, and add brightness and color to some dark corner of the world. One may be a lily, and teach a lesson of love and purity to every eye that sees. One may be a climbing vine, and hide the rugged outlines of some dark rock. One may be a great oak among those boughs the birds shall nest and sing, and beneath whose shade the flocks shall rest at noon, but every one will be something worthwhile, something rare, something perfect. There are undreamed of possibilities in the common lives all around us in a large sense. There are no common people. In times of national stress and peril, the cracker box loafer of the corner store and the village drunkard become heroes and statesmen through the quickening of principle of power within them. There is a genius in every man and woman, waiting to be brought forth. Every village has its great man or woman, someone to whom all go for advice in time of trouble, someone who is instinctively recognized as being great in wisdom and insight. To such a one, the minds of the whole community turn in times of local crisis, he is tacitly recognized as being great. He does small things in a great way. He could do great things as well, if he did but undertake them. So can any man. So can you. The principle of power gives us just what we ask of it. If we only undertake little things, it only gives us power for little things. But if we try to do great things in a great way, it gives us all the power there is. But beware of undertaking great things in a small way. 
Of that we shall speak farther on. There are two mental attitudes a man may take. One makes him like a football. It has resilience and reacts strongly when force is applied to it, but it originates nothing. It never acts of itself. There is no power within it. Men of this type are controlled by circumstances and environment. Their destinies are decided by things external to themselves. The principle of power within them is never really active at all. They never speak or act from within. The other attitude makes man like a flowing spring. Power comes out from the center of him. He has within him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. He radiates force, highest felt by his environment. The principle of power in him is in constant action. He is self-active. He hath life in himself. No greater good can come to any man or woman than to become self-active. All the experiences of life are designed by providence to force men and women into self-activity, to compel them to cease being creatures of circumstances and master their environment. In his lowest stage, man is the child of chance and circumstance and the slave of fear. His acts are all reactions, resulting from the impingement upon him of forces in his environment. He acts only as he is acted upon, he originates nothing. But the lowest savage has within him a principle of power sufficient to master all that he fears. And if he learns this and becomes self-active, he becomes as one of the gods. The awakening of the principle of power in man is the real conversion, the passing from death to life. It is when the dead hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forth and live. It is the resurrection and the life. When it is awakened, man becomes a son of the highest and all power is given to him in heaven and on earth. Nothing was ever in any man that is not in you. No man ever made more spiritual or mental power than you can attain, or did greater things you become what you want to be. End of chapter 1